Well, hello. I'm just drinking my Earl Grey tea here and getting really excited about doing an expanding foam custom background on this 40 gallon terrarium here. Got this terrarium on Craigslist for a good deal. I'm really excited to make a vivarium in it and this is how I'm gonna get started. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is flip this tank over because I want to install the under tank heater as soon as possible to get that drying so that I can um, start to do the rest of the build. And so it's good to, um, even though I am putting a fairly thick layer of substrate and rep the, the you know, ZooMed says that if you have a thick layer of substrate, you should put it on the side. It's just part of me has trouble um, just from a design perspective putting um, putting a heater on the side of something because it just seems like it's so much less, it would be so much less efficient that way. So I am going to go ahead and put it on the bottom. One thing that's important to notice about that um, is on most tanks, uh, except for like the Exoterra ones, you're, you're gonna wanna put these little things these little footings or spacers on the bottom. That way the cord of the, um, the under tank heater does not get pinched. There's a bunch of warnings on here because they don't want you to burn down your house and then sue them. So I'm gonna carefully flip this tank over and I'm also gonna pay attention to which side is the front and which side is the back because Later, when I do my foam build, I want to make sure I do it on the right side of the tank so that it will be easy for me to open the tank later. You don't want to have it so that the door slides towards the back, obviously. Carefully flip this tank over. And so this side is the back, and I know that I'm going to want my heater in the back right corner. So what I'm gonna do really quickly is put a little bit of alcohol on there. Take a sip of my Earl Grey tea. Adjust the camera to make sure that you can see what I'm doing here. All right, so just wipe Wiping that off, super easy. I'll go ahead and wipe these corners right now so that I'll be ready to apply those stickers. And on the other terrarium I did, I actually had an extra set. I had an extra set of these, so I put, um, I put eight of them on, and I would really like to do that on this terrarium since it's so big, but I'll have to wait. Maybe I could make something that would be an equivalent of that. Um, so I want it to go like this here in the back. So I'm just sort of scoping it out before I peel this stuff off. Because once you peel this off, you've got to use that, that heating pad right away. So I flipped this thing over. I already attached the under tank heater. It looks good. I attached the little feet. That way the cord is not getting pinched. And now I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna add silicon, um, aquarium, special aquarium sealant silicon just to be on the safe side because this wasn't designed to be holding water. And I'm not planning on making it a polydarium or having any standing water really at the bottom, but I'm gonna have, I'm gonna spend a lot of hours setting this up. And there's gonna be a bioactive substrate in here. There's gonna be all kinds of plants that will hopefully get really well established. There's going to be driftwood and this whole custom carved expanding foam background here and a snake in here. So I don't want to have to take all of that stuff out to have to deal with a leak should a leak occur. Even if a small amount of water is dripping out of it, it would be really annoying. So I'm going to go, go ahead and use this. Um, and the first thing, the first step I'm going to do is just like with most um, adhesion type things 
is to make sure that everything is clean. So I'm going to use the same isopropyl alcohol. So that's all good. And now I'm going to go ahead and pop this opening on this container. And this stuff is black, so you can really see where it's been used. Um, I think that'll be, in this instance, that will be helpful. It is going to look a little messy, like I said, but you won't be able to see it because of this frame here. And I'm going to focus mostly on these joints. That's sort of the part that I'm most concerned about leaking. smooth that with my finger and I think that looks pretty good pretty dang good um, this is one of those things that I normally would kind of freak out about and be like all OCD about especially if it's something I haven't practiced or it's like a material that I haven't worked with before but when I'm learning something new um, that can be a problem or it can at least end up wasting a lot of time so what I'm trying to get better at is just really um, just going for it right away my uh expanding foam build is going to be on this part and that's really important to get that oriented correctly you don't want to accidentally build the foam onto this part and then later realize you're going to have to set the terrarium up in a place where you're opening the lid out backwards that would be super awkward so that's all set up now is one of my favorite parts this is where the um, creativity really comes in so it's time to go to the store and pick out some pieces of driftwood and luckily the store that I go to is really nearby oh dang it's raining okay so here you go here are here's the store look at that oh manzanita sustainably harvested manzanita branches and oh dang what's that back there oh man look at that hide uh, applewood hide whoa and look at these pieces of old manzanita too. And all of this stuff um, at the right price. So this is sort of my studio zone for um, working on branches. I got my saw out here and my T, and now I'm just gonna clean off branches and start cutting them down to the size. So now I'm just going through and choosing the pieces I want. This was live manzanita wood when I harvested it, and I'm just going through choosing pieces that I like the look of, that look like they have good dimensions for my tank, and I'm breaking off these pieces here, and I've done this before with clippers, and then you end up with this really clean cut, sort of like here where I, where I harvested it with a saw, and it doesn't look natural, so the best thing to do is to try to snap pieces with your hands. I got some of those pieces, and I'm just going through with um, with a, a hose sprayer and also a brush and just cleaning off, clean them off as much as I can. And this is the part where I get to sort of just be creative and try to think of how I would use different pieces of wood. This would be awesome too. It's a pretty heavy piece though. I don't think I'm gonna use that in this build. I might just stick with the look of this smooth manzanita. thing to remember when doing this and the next stage is 
um, when you put the foam in and you start putting all these branches in, you can get really excited about creating an intricate system with branches, but if you're not careful, you end up creating something where your hands are unable to reach in and, and spread the silicon onto the foam where you need to cover it up. So you gotta make sure that you leave big enough gaps in the whole setup so it's not too awkward to move your hands around in there. So that was probably a mistake right there. This is a really beautiful piece and I cut off another branch that was coming out right here and as you can see, I did that with a saw so it created this flush cut that looks very fake. Um, if I had left a little bit more of that, it would have been a better looking piece and that sort of stands out, at least to me. That's the kind of thing you might be able to conceal in the foam. The main element that I want to make sort of the central piece of this vivarium, I have it with this long manzanita branch coming here and then this other curved one sort of forming an X in the middle. So basically I played around with them a little bit and looked at, looked at a lot of the branches I had available to me and then based on that I started shortening them so that they would fit into what I imagine is my 40 gallon tank. So this would be looking down and I tried to create something interesting. At first I thought maybe I'd be able to get it. Sometimes it's a single piece of wood. So you could have something like this, for example, I think this comes from the roots of an apple tree and you can see this has a lot going on with it. And this could probably be the, the focal point of hardscaping in a small terrarium maybe like a 18 by 18 by 18 and then you would build your everything else your design around that piece so sometimes it's a single piece of wood like that or a single rock or whatever in this case I have these two branches and I think that's gonna do it for me then I'll come in with other small pieces but first what I'm gonna do is see how this fits inside of the 40. Gotta admit it's been like an hour and um, this is one of my favorite parts even though I feel like sometimes I can obsess about it too much but it's probably something you don't want to rush because it's one of the most creative parts of setting up the whole vivarium artistically I think and so I've been I've been working it out sort of just composition wise what would I think looks interesting what the shapes are that I think are interesting and you can see um, I have this piece of wood that has a, a natural hole through it that I want to use as the entrance to some sort of hide and I have this one gallon water jug stuck in there as a possible way to keep that open another thing you can do that a lot of people use are balloons you can inflate balloons and put them in before you put down the foam. You can also see that I've used some tape here to hold a branch up and that's another tool that you'll want to use when you're trying to get this stuff all in order. And the other thing that I have to remember is if I'm going to be building a lot of the background here I'm probably going to need to flip this aquarium on its side for most of that and making sure that I'll be able to stabilize the branches even with it flipped. So I did a little bit of changing of the arrangement in there, mostly simplifying, and I'm ready to do the foam. 
I decided I'm going to do the foam in two stages because a lot of it actually needs to happen near the bottom front to hold pieces in place and I'm going to do that before I even start um, worrying about the back. And once that has dried a little bit, I'll be able to flip it on its side and do the back. So I'm just going to go for it. The stuff calls for using eyewear and gloves. I don't know how necessary that is, but better safe than sorry when it comes to eyes. I'm supposed to shake it for 30 seconds. Okay, and this stuff, once you open it, you can't use it again. So you gotta be ready to use it all. It will expand in the thing and um, uh, clog it up. So you gotta use one can of So I'm done with the first can of foam. I started with the tank in the position it's going to exist in instead of having it flipped on the side because most of the foam I was applying was going to be on the floor of the terrarium and you can see how I've used the foam basically to attach my wood pieces together and unify them and to also sort of build up a bit of a wall here so that there can be a hide back there. Now I sort of wish that I could keep going and use the second can and start working on the background, the back wall, but I can't because if the terrarium is standing up like this the material won't stick on the glass and the foam will just fall off. It's been about eight hours since I did the first round, the first can of spray foam, and you can see how much this stuff has expanded. That's a weird bit there. That's the last part that came out of the can. But you can see that it's, it's expanded quite a bit, and it's definitely cured enough to do the next stage. So I'm going to flip the whole thing on its side, and do the can of foam that I'm going to apply to the back here. Okay, so that was the second can, and I'm thinking now I probably could have used three cans on this build, but I don't need that much of the foam on the background for the design and the look that I'm going for, but usually with this stuff, you want to have a little bit extra. Also, the part where you're applying the foam at the beginning, it is hard to control the shape of it but most of the shaping and the more precise design parts with the foam are going to ha happen afterwards in the carving stage so this stuff that I did last night is ready to carve but this stuff down here it will be eight hours so like tonight I could start doing the carving and that's when I will spend a lot more time working on the shape that I want and getting if I want little nooks and crannies or places to put epiphytes or other plants up in the background. So this is probably one of the parts that takes the longest and is the most fun. It 
if you're interested in the artistic part and the scaping part, this is one of the stages where you really get to play. I like this serrated knife and I also used my um, Swiss Army knife but basically at this point the main thing that you need to do from a functional perspective is expose the, as far as I understand, the silicon that we're going to use later needs to adhere to this rough textured part of the foam instead of the smooth outer surface so you need to basically at the very minimum cut the foam off enough to expose that inner part and then the only other thing that you're doing is the aesthetic part or if you're trying to carve a cave or carve a spot for plants to go in that's another thing that you would be doing at this stage but for me half of the work I'm going to be doing or three-fourths of the work that I'm going to be doing is for the aesthetic part in here it's definitely going to be trickier where there's these branches so that's one thing that's going to be a bit of a challenge but yeah So at this point I've done a lot of the carving. I started just by carving off the smooth outer layer of the expanding foam so that the inner layer is exposed and um, already that gave it a nice shape and I did a little bit of more style cutting and um, I made a couple different niches in the foam for plants or water dishes. I also worked on a little bit of a cave um, or a tunnel that goes from back here which is going to be a hide to um, to the front and I'm kind of thinking that this would be a good enclosure. I'm kind of thinking this will be a good enclosure for a ball python. I just vacuumed in there and got the little pieces of foam that were lying around I got all those out and now I made a mixture, basically a substrate mixture. It has a lot of cocoa coir, sphagnum moss, and a little bit of like a ABG mix, Atlanta Botanical Gardens mix. And I have my silicon ready, the really messy um, black silicon. And I'm going to wear gloves and basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through everywhere where you can see foam right now. I'm going to go through and cover that with silicon. And while the silicon's still sticky, I'm going to take some of that substrate and stick it onto there and rub it around and try to cover as much of the foam as possible. So this is where it comes in handy that I'm using this black foam because the most 
most common expanding foams are sort of that yellow color, yellow insulation color, and when you miss a spot with the yellow kind, it really stands out, but luckily this won't stand out as much. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with this messy process. This is the messiest part of the whole thing. And there's not really a good way of doing it except trying to do one part at a time. So, for example, I'll just start in here and try to get as much of that as possible and probably starting with the hardest to reach areas and then moving my way up. I think I want to break that off. So uh, make sure you wear clothes that you don't mind getting messed up. And it's good to have one clean hand that you're using for the, the caulking gun and then one dirty hand for smearing the stuff around. You could try using a tool for smearing the stuff around, but if you have a lot of nooks and crannies and a really uneven surface the way that I do, I don't think, I tried doing it with a tool before and it was really just a pain in the butt. So one of the main things I'm going to try to do now is avoid getting this stuff on the wood, especially the wood that I like the look of because it will ruin the, the look of the wood um, and I'll probably have to stick, um, you know, the cocoa bar onto it. See, I already got a little bit of silicone on this wood where I didn't want it. Now I'm going to take my substrate. And this substrate should probably be a little bit more dry. I think that you get better adhesion with, when it's dry, but I forgot to take my substrate out and dry it in advance, so the cocoa bar is a little bit wet. Now I'm going to take my clean hand that doesn't that's not covered in silicone and just come through and um, sprinkle substrate on the parts that I just covered and I'm gonna do this in two stages I'm gonna do this one with the terrarium standing in this position and try to get all the surfaces that are facing up this way and then I'm gonna do it from the other side um, and get all of the surfaces that are facing that way covering the background using the silicone and putting silicone on little by little and while it was still wet pushing substrate onto it. I used a mixture of coco coir and sphagnum moss and a little bit of worm castings and so that was the last piece of the hardware build and then I got the nut part definitely takes a while. I spent more time doing it because there always seemed to be little pieces that you miss and so I spent more time doing it on this one than the last vivarium that I built. I didn't video all of that and then now what I've done is I've gone through and added my substrate. I made a mixture loosely based on the Atlanta Botanical Gardens mix, the ABG mix that uses cocoa coir, charcoal, sphagnum moss, the original recipe calls for tree fern, but I just used orchid bark and larger chunks of cocoa coir. Um, so I use a mixture of that for the substrate, and then I have a bunch of these leaves also. And these are leaves from my loquat tree that I boiled to clean them. And I've added a bunch of those, and I added some in this back area for some of a somewhat of a hide. This is the area over the heat pad 
and I just put in a ton of these leaves. These leaves are also um, biodegradables, so this provides food for the detritivores, the cleanup crew. I also started to add the biology. This, this soil mix I had prepped and kept moist for a while in a bin, in a big plastic tote bin. And I had added isopods to it and some live soil and other detritivores to start getting the substrate to be bioactive. I also always keep some detritivores in a small container like this. And you can see that there's some, um, there's some earthworms in here also. And there are isopods and... There are some springtails, so I took soil out of here and added it into there, and I'll probably add more and just start getting the bio biology built up even before I have the light. So I don't have plants in here yet, but I'm trying to get those detritivores to start creating a stable food web in the substrate even before I add the plants and I'm not going to add plants until I get a good lighting system. So just wanted to do that update and that's sort of the last segment of the build and the hardscaping and now it's going to go more into the biology of it, getting the system working and getting the plants. Putting the plants in is definitely, there's a large aesthetic component to it but the plants are also a very important part of the ecosystem and the nutrient cycling. They're the only thing that is really converting the waste products from all of the heterotrophs into oxygen and um, plant matter. So they play a really important role and getting them, getting at least a few plants in here will be critical. It's also a big aesthetic choice and one of the parts that I enjoy the most. So I'm already thinking about some of the plants that I might use. So I'm just gonna go around a little bit and show, give a little bit of a feel for what it looks like. You can see the background here and uh, how it's covered in the coco coir. I made a few pockets that could be plantable, but nothing major. Maybe some air plants could get pinned up here or some small succulents in some of these little pockets. There will also be space for doing some plants down here, probably um, the main area where I'll do plants, and I don't think I'm going to do any plants up on here. And this is going to be the hide, and this is going to be a very warm zone. But that's the basic look of it.